honored as always to be able to uh, sit down with Richard Osler. How are you, sir? I'm good, Richie. You're doing good work. Oh, uh, listen, you're always so nice. In fact, here's the thing. Uh, Richard Osler may be the nicest uh, LDS uh, or whatever we're supposed to say um, podcaster in the space. Um, you recently had a guy that I had interviewed on, and I want you to know this because I think that this is significant. At the end of the episode, you were very kind to me, uh, and you didn't need to be. And I and I just think it's commendable that you uh, that you always show up as like a kind person more than you need to be, well, right? Like there's lots of kind people, but like you know, in what you're doing with the, you know, listen, learn and love and your podcast and the books, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit here in a second, when I get around to it, after I compliment you like crazy, uh, <laughs> is that, I mean, it's, it's genuine, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Thank uh, you. And I, and I appreciate the heck out of that. Thank you. Uh, I also should say, uh, I'm, uh, th this is, uh, an unofficial passing of the torch. Uh, in some ways, Richard, because, uh, uh, you know, life has been a little bit busy for me and I kind of keep up on what number you're on in producing your episodes and I see what number I'm at and I'm going to be eclipsed. No. For a, while, for a little while I have said, you know, I am the most producing and technically I am because I have like a couple hundred that don't have numbers associated with it. There you but go. to the public facing, you will be the guy uh, that has the most episodes uh, published that is a positive force for good within the church. So I handedly pass you that torch and say, congratulations, sir. You will always be the trailblazer <laughs> and a brave soul who stepped in this space, and that won't ever be replaced regardless of the number of episodes on other platforms. So well, and I and I have to tell you, it's so fun for me too. And I promise we're going to talk about the book, everybody. That's like, what are we doing here? Are we just catching up? Is this social hour with the Richards? Um, but uh, it's so fun for me to be able to hear when you chat with someone, and when I'm able to chat with someone, yeah. and the the things that that you're able to bring to the table, and that I'm able to bring to the table, because you know, I'm sure that people listening to this go. Okay, well, listen, this person's doing the book tour, you know, they're going to talk with Kurt over at Leading Saints, and then they're going to talk to someone from one of the LDS living properties, and then they're going to talk to Richard Osler, then they're going to talk to Mormonland, and then they're going to, but I think it's commendable to to note that, you know, when, you, when you're visiting with people, it's, you're able to go places that I don't go or, or, you know, choose not to go, and then vice versa, that we're able to to really be able to to share these people that are sharing themselves. So kudos to you. Thank you. You nice guy. All right. Enough of this. I'm getting I'm starting to get sick to my stomach a little bit with how nice I'm being. That's not me. I'm not the nice guy. You are. You um sent me a book in the mail the other day. And I have to tell you, uh so the cover of the book looks similar to the cover of other books. I should mention, Listen, Learn, and Love, Building the Good Ship Zion looks like the cover of your other couple books. And in my mind, I was thinking, and this is terrible of me, I thought, did he just not like it the last time he wrote it? And he just changed some things, and now he's putting it. But it's a whole completely different book. So let's start there. Yeah, it's the third book, and um, it is called good, Building the Good Ship Zion. And if it's okay, can I just read a little bit of the introduction? Of course. Um, um, it talks about President Ballard's talk about stay in the book, stay in the boat and hold on. And um, once while walking my neighborhood, I reflected on the idea of the boat. My mind pivoted from the blessings I gained by staying in the boat to what I could do to make the boat a warm, welcoming place for others, a place of belonging where everyone feels needed, included. I've met with hundreds of good folks who want to stay in the boat, most of whom agree with President Ballard, but often wonder if they are truly welcome and needed in the boat. In fact, some of them even feel pushed out. During that walk, I tweeted out what we can do to make the boat a more welcoming and accepting. Um, these were a, a series of tweets on the subject, some of which are now chapters in the book. People offered many thoughtful responses as they brainstormed. 
One response from Matthew G. Holland of Las Vegas, Nevada, no relation to the Holland family, especially stuck with me and provided motivation to the book. He wrote, it's really, ju it's just a really big boat. What a powerful and simple concept. Early in my life, I never would have looked inward to consider what I can do to help people currently in the boat feel like they belong. I assumed they were having the same fulfilling boat ride as me. Mm. Someone bravely opened up about not feeling comfortable in the boat. I put it all back on them to get comfortable, perhaps even caused them to feel embarrassed for sharing their feelings, concerns, or experiences, perhaps shaming them to get in line so they figuratively sit down, sit back down and stop rocking the boat. All of this just added their wondering if they were truly welcome. I failed to realize that the good ship Zion is strong enough to be a safe place if we want to stand or sit, and I need to learn to be comfortable with that. Perhaps it strengthens us to bring our whole selves as we jointly come into Christ and build Zion. In short, it was hard to see the beam in my own eye. Hmm. So that's a little bit from the introduction, and then it's about seven chapters of just individual topics that we can do to make the boat more welcoming. And the reason why is I believe in the boat, and I believe in the blessings that come from membership in the church and the healing and the hope and the perspective it gives us. And I've met with a lot of people, Richie, just like you, that have a testimony of a restored gospel that sometimes feel if they're welcome. Have you yourself ever wondered if you felt welcome? It's it's an interesting thing, and, and it's not a completely innocent question, because I think the majority of my life, I have always sort of felt welcome, but in the last maybe year or so, it's not that I haven't felt welcome, but I have looked around the room when worshiping and going, you know, if this is a if this is a ship, this is a cruise ship full of people that I don't know that I normally would be on a cruise ship full of, and and am or like they're all right that I'm here right now, but also like why aren't there other people like me on this cruise ship? So let me retreat that all back and ask you: Have you ever felt like that where you are like? I don't know. Yeah, probably a couple right times. Ship? I'm generally kind of in the bullseye of LDS privilege, um, just age. and um, But uh, when my wife and I were dating 35 years ago, I opened up about, you know, I'm left center politically and she's right center, right politically. And that was 35 years ago. And we have not changed. It's, you know, we still have, we're in a mixed political marriage. And <laughs> as we've, grown up we haven't tried to move each other to either side and we haven't moved our six kids with an agenda to get them to dad's side of thinking or mom's side of thinking and we look at that as we're completely unified in the gospel of jesus christ but we have differences and we actually think it's a good thing yes to your question sometimes i feel like a minority with my political views in my lds congregation is mostly not left-leaning democrat not left-leaning mm -hmm. And so, um, and then when I started to say kind things about LGBTQ people, um, supportive of the church and our doctrine, our leaders, just something culturally, um, most Latter-day Saints don't do is just proactively say kind things about people, that group of people, which has been a central focus of what I've been trying to do within our faith, as you're aware. And so those are a couple of times that's helped me to understand that I don't always fit the, all the checklists of a typical Latter-day Saint. And to your point, I bet most of us don't. And sometimes we wonder if we belong or we're needed or did. And that's certainly true of groups that I've talked about in the past, like LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. Yeah, and it's interesting to to, cause I, to kind of add into that. Like sometimes it's like, yes, of course I'm needed. And man, is the church going to have this kind of voice if I decide not to go anymore but also it's like, man, I'm just tired. I just want to go. And I just want someone to go. Yeah. I feel that same way, <laughs> you know? And um, I know that in some cases we can't expect people to be able to feel, you know, the same way that we do. So I understand that, but man, sometimes to be that, you know, some people will call it disruptor, not in the, you know, I'm standing and disrupting a class, but being that person that looks at something a little bit different or being, uh, you know, someone that has a different political view, a different religious view, a different accepting view, whatever the thing may be. Like there, there will be those times where I'm just like, 
yes, I am uniquely called to do that. And also, it's so exhausting. Can someone else join me in this yoke for a minute so I don't feel like I'm doing this alone? Is there anyone else here that feels this way? Can we do this together? And I think, quite honestly, that sometimes people just get tired. I like, I agree with all that. And um, I think that's the reality for life as a lot of Latter day Saints. Is there, if I just read the seven chapters in the book? Of course. So um, this book is on Amazon and at Desert Book. And these, as as I we pointed out earlier, not it's not like you got to read chapter one to get chapter two. Mm-hmm. Um, this is typical of my second, first and second book. And most of the content of this is not my experience for your listeners. It's me elevating the voices of others in these different groups. Cause I know that when we hear perspectives like Richie sharing his thoughts, our hearts change because we see things in a way that makes us better ministers. We can better mourn, bear more in comfort. So not chapter one is loving members who are four year sitters. And this is out of a conversation we had when I served in my YSA assignment, should we pass the sacrament to those in the foyer? And there was some comments like if they were really faithful, they'd be in the chapel. And we looked in the handbook and thought there's no rule that prevents us from. And so let's let's not create new rules. Let's pass the sacrament to those in the foyer. And this chapter is not a real heavy, serious doctrinal chapter. It just it just teaches a principle. We shouldn't create rules and we shouldn't be sifters. We should be gathers. Was there also part of a, that conversation that was like, that's missing the point. They're yes. there. That's what they're there for. If they're in the hall or... You yes. know, they're standing underneath the basketball standard with their arm up in the air and you need to bring them the sacrament. It doesn't matter. They're in the building. That's the point. We don't have to do it the with our right hand and pass and th- yeah, that's so all the things. We miss the point. Sorry, I get really we charged. Well, agreed. And we leave the building to pass sacrament to people that are sick. And so yes. um, we're called to be gathers, not sifters. And then this chapter also has stories from four-year sitters that I've never considered. Why I've never been a foyer sitter. Um, I've been late, missed the sacrament. I've never sure. felt more comfortable in the foyer. But then I realized why actually people are why they're in the foyer. Chapter two is is it okay to turn down a calling? And it's kind of this idea of is it, did when we got baptized, did we covenant then to accept every calling that's given to us? And for some, that can feel overwhelming. And I saw this firsthand as I share in the chapter a uh, high counselor that left the church during my mission in England 35 years ago. And it's sort of showing that, you know, what's our doctrine behind that? And maybe it's the right thing not to accept every calling and still be a committed Latter-day Saint. Chapter number three, and this is a serious chapter, is ministering to those with church-generated pain or trauma. And I had a LDS therapist write this chapter because I'm not a therapist. Her name is Tanya Miller. And it's this space where um, some people have painful experiences at church. It could be a member, it could be a leader, and it causes trauma, either capital T trauma or lower T trauma. She talks about four types of trauma, and our flight or natural flight or fight response is to leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but those that we may also have a testimony of the restored gospel. So somehow we have to heal from that trauma. And um, I think the first step is to acknowledging in our restored church, this is a possibility and a reality for some. Yeah. This is a serious chapter about, you know, acknowledging this can exist. We can still have faith in our church and our leaders, um, but gives us better principles and ministering insights to help those that have had really painful um, experiences. And she's brave. She shares about her brother and her son uh, so she brings the perspective of an active Latter Day Saint um, and her and her understanding of not only therapy but the atonement. Just to add on to that, the thing that I think that is additionally interesting about that in particular is the dissonance that is sometimes created, where you go, "How can this thing that is so good, yeah, have this? It can't be." You know, people. It almost it is it is that that literal dissonance where they're like, "I don't understand how." It can be a good thing that, you know, saving lives and eternal life and all these things, and also 
have you know these instances of trauma that are that are created whether like you mentioned big t or little t like it is it is difficult for we as humans to go it can be the greatest thing ever and and have created a traumatic you know experience for said individual it can be you know a, a place that this person doesn't feel comfortable for this and this and this and be the place that provides the saving ordinances that allow us to live with our heavenly father. Instead we go, well, if it's this, it can't, it can't clearly be this. And so I appreciate the heck out of that chapter. Yeah. And our gut reaction mine is, is to defend the church and minimize people's experience that have different. I've learned to do, to, I can sit with people in their pain and often that heals them. I, I'm an analogy guy, Richie. So I think of the gospel of Jesus Christ as this pure water um, that only is the source of healing and hope and perspective and all the things. And it needs an institution to hold the water, which I think is the pool. Hmm. Below the water line is the porcelain lining of the pool, which represents our interaction with church and people and culture. And most people, when they lean back on their bare skin, have a really positive experience below the water, but some don't. And there's kind of jarring parts of the porcelain that may be impacting people in a way that causes pain, even if we can't see what's below the waterline that they're interacting with. So that's kind of how I try to share this concept. Um, so that's a pretty serious chapter. And I encourage local leaders, parents, everybody to read that because I, I think we'll have better insights on how to support people. Well, and to your point, that's what I love about everything that you do when you chat with folks in the books that you write. It is what what I uh, particularly love about how you present it, it's not, I, Richard Osler, am right, and everyone needs to get in line behind these things. It isn't. And I, and you know that there are some people who do those kind of things. If you don't agree with me, you are clearly intellectually inferior. I can't wait till you rise to the level of where I'm at. And that's just not, you know, that's not you, and it's not the way that things go. But what I love is it's the opportunity to say, hey, Here's a story. Here's a person's experience. Here's a different way of looking at something. And, you know, there are some things that when I read or when I listen to you, I go, ah, I'm not so, yeah, maybe. Fine. But 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 I do listen and I go, you know, there is part of that that I had never considered before. There is an aspect of that that, you know, could be difficult. The ability to just sit with someone and have them say, hard things about the church that I don't necessarily believe. I don't have to tell them they're wrong. I don't have to tell them, oh, it couldn't have possibly be. They didn't mean to do that. No one would have ever done all those things that sort of minimize it. It's just, it's a it's a walk in someone else's shoes for a minute. And the way that you are able to present that within all these chapters, but in particular within that one, I think is just, and uh, you know, written by someone else, but being able to go, wow, okay, okay. Um. You're very kind and well said. The next chapter, chapter four, is how should we treat those who leave the church? And this isn't a cha chapter, an invitation to leave the church, but it's a it's responding to President Nelson's charge to reduce, um, reduce divisiveness. And sometimes there's more tension between those that are in the church and left the church versus those that have never joined the church. And mm. I don't think it needs to be that way, but it needs work on both sides. So this is voices from both sides talking about how to do better. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, do you find like that some of these things, it, it's um, it's interesting to me, the older I get, and since you're so much older than me, that's why I asked this question of you. Like 40 years older. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Stop it. Um, but we're like, there's some things that they're, they're very simple, which doesn't mean easy, but, but like, because we as humans, because we as members of the church, we we make things more difficult. We lose the simplicity, certainly of the gospel, or like, you know, the, the question is, how should we treat others, you know, those that leave the church? Well, we should treat them well. Like, it's, it's not, you, you know, uh, it, it's hard sometimes to do, especially if they're saying disparaging things about the church, or, you know, there's those different things. There's ways that it can be difficult, but the very base of the question, like as I, as a first glance, when 
because with the book, you sent me kind of an outline of all the chapters. And I was like, how should we treat them? I'm like, well, Richard, we should treat them <laughs> next you know, like brothers and sisters. How about we do something else? Can we get a little deeper? But I think that the way that it's walked out is pretty great. Um, chapter five. Yeah. Um, chapter five is supporting members dealing with death. And this has been a blind spot for me, for your listeners, because I've I would always just kind of give platitudes that everything's fine in the next life because of our plan and salvation and probably not sit with people in the pain of, of today. And I worry that some of our readers have pointed out in a culture, um, we may create a culture where faithful Latter-day Saints grieve for a short period of time. And because they have such a strong testimony, the plan of salvation, they move on. Hmm. And, I think we need to allow ongoing grief, especially in very difficult situations, and not create a culture that a faithful missionary stays on their mission because they're so faithful and they didn't come home. And I think we need to create a space for people to grieve and come home and and still have a testimony they're going to be with their loved one in the next life. And so there's some brave people that share heartbreaking stories in this chapter. One woman who lost her brother to suicide and then her sister and her sister's twin kids. I'm in a car accident driving home from church. Um, just heartbreaking stories, but because they're walking this road, they have incredible insights on things we should or shouldn't say. And I wish I'd read a chapter like this decades ago, because I have not always known what to say to somebody now, or should I keep the conversation going? And so there's, there's a woman who was the driver of her car when she fell asleep and, um, her own child died in the car crash and oh. she talks about that on Mother's mm -hmm. Day. And so oh. these are not meant to just make us sad, but these brave authors, some that have written books about their experience, I wanted to elevate their voices. So that's a little bit about chapter five. Is it okay if I go to six or do you have? Uh, no, I want to ask you a question. Come on. All right. Good. I, I want to ask you a question about that. How, so now as you look back, you know, I mean, we got a couple more chapters we got to talk to, so we'll keep it relatively brief. But like, what is, what is it that you've changed? What is it that you do differently to show up for those that are grieving? I, I keep talking. I thought it, it opened wounds to keep talking about the person that had died. And I've learned to keep talking about the person and use the person's name. Hmm. Most people I talk to are glad that their loved one hasn't been forgotten. They haven't moved on. We may have moved on to the next funeral in our ward or the next experience. They have not moved on. Um, doesn't mean they don't believe in the plan of salvation and they're working through the stages of grief. But sure. um, that's and not to give a platitude like, well, you'll see them in the next life or right. know the plan of salvation. That keeps me in my emotional safe box without sort of the need to grieve and try to understand the pain they're feeling and stay engaged after the first wave and at least in LDS culture where there's a funeral, there's a great outpouring. We're talking about the loved one and testimony meeting and they need that ongoing ministering support. Um, I have it, you know, I've in the, on the temple prayer roll at times, I put the names of deceased people on the prayer roll because I think they're grieving. I think they're in a great spot with God and our savior, but I think they're grieving they feel this is not doctrinal, but this is my feeling. They feel the same human emotions because they're still human in the next life. And they're yeah. grieving loved ones, especially if they died young or sort of uh, just in a, in a situation where their full mortality wasn't realized perhaps that they're grieving what could have become. And they still understand all the blessings of that will still happen, but they're missing their parents if they're a young or their spouse. So that's just something I do once in a while personally, because I try to put my shoes in someone on the other side who's maybe still grieving. Yeah, what an interesting perspective. I've never considered that because I think we sort of go, they pass on and the light and the all the people welcoming them and it's joy, 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 and joy, which I'm, sure, which I'm sure that it is. Yeah, to your point, I'm sure that it is. And there's probably some element of like, man, I... I really miss being able to be, you know, in a body with raising my kids, you know, raising my kids or, you know, being with those people. That's an interesting thing. I'd never, never, never considered. Well, it's not doctrinal listeners. Well, sure, sure. But it's fun to talk about, isn't it? I'm not suggesting we suddenly go to the temple and put on the prayer roll everybody that's died. 
No, but 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 you walk it out in a way that makes sense. And and everyone who gets upset about that stuff, listen, it's a perspective. You don't have to, he's not writing a book about anyway. Uh I will say this. The other thing that that I'll just sort of adjoin to that, one of the greatest things, and I and I want to say that um I've learned it in the time that we've known each other is the ability to say, I don't know what to say to the person. <laughs> That's good. You know, hey. I, you know, I, there's a dear friend of, of ours, her husband um, went into for a doctor's appointment, wasn't feeling very well, checked into the hospital, died in the same week. So like he still had laundry at home that he hadn't done. It wasn't like he knew that this was the end of it. And and she's wrecked. They'd been married for 40 years. They never had kids. They were each other's everything, you know, all of these things. And and I, I, I want to say, hey, you know, I mean, they're not members of church. I want to say all the things. And I realize none of it matters. And so, you know, we have had multiple conversations where I just say, you know what? I don't know, but I'm so sorry. And, 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 and I, you know, I search for that right thing to say, and I, I won't say the right thing ever. That's just my tendency. But to just be like, hey, you know what? He's great. You guys had a love that was unique, and I don't know what to say. Um, I love that, Richie. You said something really insightful, multiple conversations. So this wasn't a one conversation checkbox thing. You are present for this couple, even if you don't know what to say. And I think it makes, or this woman and family, I, it reminds me that I used to say when somebody died prematurely, well, he, he or she was nor, needed more on the other side. And yeah. Some of my listeners have pointed out to me that, you know, that's really painful to think a mother with young kids, the God we believe in would want her more on that side than this side. Right. Um, and so it can create some feelings towards God if that's the God we believe in. And I don't say that anymore because I don't know that's true. Sure. We signed up for a very imperfect mortal world. And part of that is just some fallen world and stuff happens and i don't try to connect all the dots and create a storyline around it i just do what you did multiple conversations yeah pretty good thought and i think also we shouldn't create a culture so if we elevate these people sometimes that have had a, a significant death and um, they've been able to move on then it pre-programs us how we should respond right um, if something, if we have a death in our family, well, that's the way we do it as Latter-day Saints. We grieve and then we move on. And um, from a, my therapist friends tell me that now they that may not be helpful long-term to sort of box up all that grief and not deal with it. It may be better to allow that a grief to take its course. And that may lead to more long-term healing than just boxing it up and moving on with the stiff upper lip. Yeah. So, Chapter six. Yeah, let's keep going. So let's do it. Support, this is better support for single Latter-day Saints. And I talk about, you know, I was married at 29. And I talk about being at, you're shaking your head. Yeah, menace, menace, menace. And Richard talk, Osler, so, the menace to society. This is, you know, I didn't answer this in your original question, but I remember being, you know, at peace that I wasn't married as a Latter-day Saint. I was pretty confident that I was doing what I needed to do. My mission president told me it's not time related, it's priority related. And I thought this is still a priority. And I, but LDS culture wasn't at peace with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt my identity started to become not what I was doing career wise or education wise or serving or just Christ like attributes, but I was starting to get defined by, you know, the single older 20 year old. Yeah. And that was the time that was really actually painful for me. And it caused unnecessary inward reflection. Well, what is wrong with me? And, you know, what is missing in my life? And that's not healthy. Some of that can be okay, but the, you know, we all have work we need to do. So this is, and this is part of then our YSA culture. We want to create a feeling for the YSAs that they were complete now mm -hmm. because they were divine children of heavenly parents. And being complete isn't something that comes in the future when they're married or financially stable or have a career, they need to believe they're complete now. That mm -hmm. doesn't take progress off the table. Um, it just gives you a, you're working from a position of strength because you're complete because of our doctrine, your divine children of heavenly parents, and they love you. And 
So that's sort of the focus of that chapter. And a little bit of our ward culture, we tried to make our ward culture not about how many marriages we could, you know, a scorecard of how many people <laughs> got married, but just, you know, wanting all the YSAs to feel welcome. And we figured they already knew they needed to get married. They didn't need us to continue to remind them. Yeah, it's a it's a unique thing. So recently I've been listening to um, some content created by some evangelical folks. Cool. And uh, and one of the things that I absolutely love about it is that very concept that I think we are getting better about, but that we do not get right a lot of the time, which is children of a heavenly father, good enough. Which again doesn't say you know you 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 know you you're not working and trying to be better and all that stuff, but like they embrace that like God's grace is good enough and you are so such a special person because you are created by God. They, you know, it it is not ever a, well, I, you know, I need to make sure that I've got the degree and that the spouse and the kids and the house and the this and the the and the other thing, and then I'll be what it is. I, I I'm I have some suspicion as to where some of that comes from within our culture, but man, listening to uh evangelical people talk about how it's like, yeah, no, I I'm gonna continue to get better, but I God loves me so much right now, it almost sounds um to my ears, to my very Mormon ears. Sometimes it sounds a little foreign, right? Like, what? You didn't have to prove it. You didn't have to. And then I'm like, no, wait, this is what I believe too. Hang on. How can I feel this? How can I know this more than just, you know, kind of hearing it and, and, and feeling like it's a, a thing that I don't, you know, being able to accept it, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. And that's where I think, you know, covenants is so important. And, um, you know, keeping covenants, making covenants, the temple attendance. So I totally agree with what you just said. Should should we wrap it out? Yeah, better. Chapter seven is supporting couples in their decisions about children. Um, and that single Latter-day Saints, just a quick go back, that can be divorced people. I just shared my experience, never married, but um, there's lots of stories from divorced people. Um, there's just a range of single Latter-day Saints subcategories. Sure. And that divorce uh, thing, like I felt every bit of that when I was married and then divorced yeah, and went to a singles ward and I went, nope, I yeah. was going to a family ward because this does not, this is not the feeling. This is not the, this is not what I need for my religious yeah. progression. I will be doing a family ward and, and find my way this way. Well done. Um, that's part of you just taking ownership of what's best for you within the Had church. to, had to. Um, chapter seven is supporting couples in their decisions about children. And this is, you know, we believe in personal revelation, hear him. And so every couple is going to have different feelings about children. There's even a few stories in there about um, a couples that have felt, even though it's part of our sort of temple sealing covenant to have children, they felt personal revelation not to have children. And I'm not inviting LDS couples not to have children, but let's create space for people to receive personal revelation as they're honoring their covenants and committed Latter-day Saints. And there's stories in there about couples that chose not to have biological children, but adopted a mix, foster children, lots of children, few children couldn't have children mm -hmm. uh, because of infertility. And we sometimes just create, diff we create awkwardness unintentionally, usually about, you know, when are you going to have a baby or when's the next one coming? And we, I think we do it out of love and just want to have a conversation, but that can be pretty upsetting to someone. And, you know, you know, I think our listeners know this. somebody who's, has infertility problems in particular, um, but people who've received personal revelation of one or two kids and both parents are working and they're serving in other ways. And they don't want to come to church and be triggered with and not feel like they're full fledged Latter-day Saints because they don't have a certain number of kids. And that's part of good ship Zion is big enough for, um, families with different feelings about the number of kids they should have. And let's create space for them and not create the sifting. If we're called to be gatherers and not sifters. And maybe a final thought is President Nelson talks about the gathering of Israel. And I think in the past, I just think of non-members, mm -hmm. <laughs> our efforts of missionaries to find them. And I still think of that and love that. But I think a lot about our own members. They're Israel. They haven't been completely gathered yet just because they've been baptized, they need to feel welcome, needed, and belonging, and understood. And we have work to do to look inward and say, what can we do 
to gather our own people to help them feel um, needed because they bring value and we're better off with them and their contributions. So that's kind of my final thought. Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's a thing for me that when I think about like, I mean, I think it it falls into any of these, the personal revelation, you know, whether, whether it's kids or, you know, whether the individualization of like grieving over death or any of that stuff, right? Like people are individuals and so much we want to be like, this is the box of this thing. Yeah. And when you come along, you'll figure out the same answer that I have figured out. And I think that that's where we get our, ourselves into huge trouble. And I just... Like, I get it. If someone came to me and said, you know, I have had personal revelation about the word of wisdom. And, you know, I, I feel like God said to me that, you know, coffee because of some physical thing is a thing that I need to do, right? Let, let's take this very, you know, whatever example. Okay. Okay. I'm, you know, to me, I it, where I think we get in trouble is it's like passengers on this ship have uh, pearl necklaces and a and a you know blue blue blouse and a blue skirt and that's what the women look like. So come on board if you look like this. And the men on this ship they wear suits and mustaches, but don't have them touch the. And I think that we do this. <laughs> I mean that I'm very literally am describing the tabernacle or the tabernacle choir temple square, but like. It, it's a more interesting ship. It's a, I, I think it's a, a better weighted ship. I think it's, you know, I, I don't think it's our place very often, if ever, to be, you know, saying things like, hey, I know you think this, but let me go ahead and insert myself into whatever this thing is in, in any of these things, in any of these things you talk about. That's why I love you so much, Richard. Thank you, Richie. You're doing good work. I don't even, I don't even want to like you, but I can't help it. You're just <laughs> I'm teasing you. Um, you know that whenever we chat with folks that, uh, that, uh, I ask you a series of questions because of the nature of this particular episode, we're in your parts with other, I would just be curious as to when you think about, uh, your faith and your favorite part, current day, this day, what are, what are you thinking about? What comes to mind immediately about your faith, your favorite part? Well, it's um, understanding of the atonement that came through the prophet Joseph Smith, that we have a savior that loves us. And um, that capacity is, un, is not f finite. Um, and we're all wounded. W there's the sin woundedness, but I'm talking about the other woundedness that comes through mortality. Just life is hard. Mm -hmm. And the savior understands that. And he can take that yoke on him and he wants to, it doesn't add to his burden. He's already paid the price for all of our woundedness. And so let's all turn to the savior and let him take upon our, I'm paraphrasing that not correctly. Yoke our, I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> yoke our woundedness on him. Yeah. We need therapists too, but the saviors, you know, that's my favorite part of our doctrine right now. Yeah. I appreciate being able to visit with you, sir. Thank you, Richie. <laughs>